Good morning. My name is Candace Larson, and our scripture today comes from John, chapter 13, verses 1 through 20. Now before the festival of the Passover, Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart from this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The devil had already decided that Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, would betray Jesus. And during supper, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God, got up from summer, excuse me, got up from supper, took off his outer robe, and tied a towel around himself. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was tied around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus answered, you do not know now what I am doing, but later you will understand. Peter said to him, you will never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, one who has bathed does not need to wash except for the feet, but is entirely clean. And you are clean, though not all of you, for he knew who was to betray him. For this reason, he said, not all of you are clean. After he had washed their feet, had put on his robe, and had reclined again, he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for that is what I am. So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have set you an example, that you also should do as I have done to you. Very truly, I tell you, slaves are not greater than their master, nor are messengers greater than the one who sent them. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. I am not speaking of all of you. I know whom I have chosen, but it is to fulfill the scripture. The one who ate my bread has lifted his heel against me. I tell you this now before it occurs, so that when it does occur, you may believe that I am he. Very truly, I tell you, whoever receives one whom I send receives me, and whoever receives me receives him who sent me. Holy words for God's people. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Candace. Uh, this morning, we have the privilege uh, to welcome uh, Reverend Ashley Skinner Creek. Uh, she'll be preaching for us. Uh, Ashley and I have been friends for a couple years now. Uh, she uh, is, has been a, a great person to bounce ideas off of with her heart for the church, the heart for youth and young people, and the ways in which she encourages each of us uh, to live out our calls in our various communities. Um, I'm excited for her. Uh, her official title is uh, Associate Director of Graduate Programs at Seattle Pacific Seminary. And while there, she's also the Associate Director of the uh, Liturgia Project. Uh, it's a church partnership program striving to create intergenerational mentorship opportunity for churches seeking new ways to incorporate youth into the worship life of their congregations. Um, she's a uh, provisional elder in the United Methodist Church on her journey towards ordination uh, in two years, we, we expect, and we're uh, encouraging her on that journey as well. I'm excited for all that uh, she will bring to us. So we're going to pray, and then we'll go to our promo video, and then the next voice you'll hear will be that of Reverend Ashley. Let's pray together. God, uh, open up our hearts and our minds and our ears to receive all that you have in store. Uh, bless the words that have been prepared. Bless Ashley as she delivers them. And allow your spirit to be the one that exudes from her to all of us and into the world. It is in Christ's holy name that we pray. Amen.
Well, good morning to my friends here at Bothell United Methodist Church. It is so good to be with you today, whether you're joining us online or you are here in person. It is a gift to get to come together and worship the living God. Amen? Amen. Amen. Yeah. So I love that, um, I guess, tagline, Becoming Christ in the Community. Um, One of the things I really want to talk to you all about today is this idea of community, and not just becoming Christ in the community, but our own internal longings for community and connection that is centered on Christ. And so I want to start today with a story. And this is a story that for me feels pretty close to home. So for this story, we have to turn back the clock to 2019, ages ago, It's actually not that long ago, but I don't know about you, but for me, the pandemic has done some like really weird things with time. Like 2019 simultaneously seems like a decade ago, and it also seems like just yesterday, but mostly it feels like a really, really long time ago. So 2019, there's this couple, they're in their 20s, they make a decision that they're going to move from the suburban town that they've been living in to the city. They had some friends living there, were kind of looking to be around some more younger folks their age, were trying out um, a new way of living that had less of a commute, um, and were exploring new vocational opportunities. So it was time for a change. So December 2019, they signed a lease for a small apartment in Seattle, and they move New Year's Day 2020. And the first couple months of the year are great. They're like getting to know some people their age, starting to think about trying to find a new church, maybe a church that has some young families. Um, And then March 2020 hit. And it was the beginning of stay-at-home orders and school being canceled and school going remote, restaurants shutting down, kind of like still walking around outside, but really making sure you're staying far away from people while you're doing so, masks, church online, not seeing friends in person, and the very reasonable and rational fear of getting sick and losing loved ones loomed. So over the next couple years, this couple experienced a few things. First, they moved to the city to change commute, and all of a sudden, they're working from home. And a lot of their friends moved out of the city because that change of working from home meant that you didn't have to go into the office. And so you could move to different communities and different places. And then there was finding a church, which was exceedingly difficult. Because how are you supposed to get to really know a community when you are watching online? And I think churches have gotten so much better than this in the last two years. I know a lot of people are joining online today, but at first it was sort of just like, play this video in your living room and see you next week. And it wasn't like being a part of a community at a time when this couple really needed community. And then churches began to open and new questions arise. Will this church have good pandemic guidelines? Is it safe enough to go to a barbecue? How am I supposed to get plugged in? How am I supposed to meet new people? Many of us, we haven't found answers to these questions, and so we're still feeling lonely. I think that many of us are desirous for devoted and intimate and enjoyable community and connection, but it's hard to know where to start, and it's hard to know how to find the community we long for. If you didn't figure it out, (laughs) this couple is my husband and I. But it's not just our story. It's the story of hundreds of thousands of people in the year 2022 who have experienced massive shifts in their way of living and are trying to figure out new ways of being community. I think that so many of us are still trying to figure out what to do with this loneliness that we developed because so much has changed and we've had to do so much on our own for so long. So now, here we are. We're trying to seek out connection and community, seek out new ways of being community together, but it's difficult. I've been in conversation after conversation with people who say things like, I just don't know where to find community. Or even people who are in churches saying, I'm not sure how to get plugged in at my church. 
Even people who've been going somewhere for 20 years who are saying, I don't know how to get back involved like the way I used to be. So I love this story that we read today from John's Gospel because it is a beautiful picture of intimate community. Not perfect community, but intimate community. And it's a picture of community that challenges me to reconsider what I'm searching for, what I'm longing for when I say, I want community. (laughs) When my husband and I have talked about what we are missing, what we're seeking, what we wish for, long for in terms of community, it's easy to think of a group of friends who are like us in some way. And this group of friends, they would do fun things together, they would laugh together, play games, worship together, the people you could call up and just say, want to do something, want to go on vacation. And I think we have this ethereal dream of perfect community that sometimes makes us miss opportunities for true and intimate community that are right in front of us. So I am making an assumption today that I'm not the only one who feels this way. And even if you don't feel this way right now, we've all experienced times in our lives where we have felt lonely, where we're looking for community. And if that's true, then I want us to look at this story, this story which we often hear during Holy Week, in a new way today. Let us look together for what we learn about how to seek out and live in community as God's people together. Let's explore what Christian community looks like. To do this, we're going to do first thing, we're going to do two things. The first is that we're going to examine Jesus' particular actions in this story. And then we're going to zoom out a little bit more and we're going to get a broader vision of what this community at this table looks like. So the most famous part of this story is where it begins, with Jesus washing the disciples' feet. We know this story well, right? We, we guessed it at the children's moment. One biblical scholar calls this story the heart of John's gospel because it highlights Jesus' loving connection with the Father and Jesus' loving connection with his disciples, who he'll soon call his friends. But let me give you a bit of context for this story. This story, like many of my personal favorite stories in the gospels, takes place around a table in the context of a meal. And it's at the beginning of what's referred to in John's gospel as the farewell discourse, which is a long speech, or it's more like a series of messages um, that Jesus gives specifically to his disciples during dinner. The whole discourse runs from chapter 13 in John's gospel to chapter 17. So it's like Jesus has a lot to say. (laughs) This is a long speech for the disciples, but it's important. He has a lot to tell them. And then the first thing that occurs in John chapter 18 is Judas's public betrayal of Jesus and Jesus's subsequent arrest. So this is why we often hear this story during Holy Week. A lot of times we hear it on Monday, Thursday, because it's the meal preceding Jesus's arrest and journey to the cross and ultimately his crucifixion. But in the midst of all that's going on, Jesus knows what is to come. He actually speaks in this passage that Judas' betrayal is imminent. In the midst of that, which might be very stressful and worrisome, Jesus, instead of focusing on that, stoops down low and washes his disciples' feet because he loved his own to the end. Imagine that, that God's love for God's people, is so full, so humble, so beautiful, and so vulnerable that we find God at the feet of his disciples, God at our feet. As I think back to my initial vision of community and fellowship, the concept of serving, of serving one another and serving together was strikingly absent. It's not to say that I don't want that. It's just to say that it wasn't the first thing that popped into my mind. I often find myself wanting the warm feelings or the good vibes of community, but I don't imagine the type of fellowship that would involve such a generous display of humility, hospitality, and love. I was talking about about this idea with my sister last week, and she said, Yeah, 
Christian community isn't just the people you watch the football game with. It can be. You certainly could watch the football game with your Christian community. But there's also something more. And so this story makes me wonder how serving and developing relationships in the context of service can enhance and deepen our experience of community. What we see in this passage is the interplay of intimate fellowship and humble service. You see, Jesus and these disciples, they had constantly been on the move. They were constantly serving and engaged in ministry. And when they sit down at this table and it's just them, perhaps they're just ready to laugh and eat and be together, have some time in just kind of fun and relaxing community. But Jesus, knowing that community can be richer than that, takes an opportunity to give them an example. So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have set you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Our sense of relationship with one another, our depth of fellowship and intimacy and community is emboldened as we serve together and serve one another in love. The intimacy and example of service that we see in this passage is actually the community I think we need. I think it's what so many of us long for. I know it's what Jesus offers us as God incarnate and what the Spirit is inviting us into. In fact, this is the type of fellowship that early Christians built their idea of church upon. In Acts chapter 2, we see this vision of the early church and how it's described is as follows. The believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the community, to their shared meals, and to their prayers. All believers were united and shared everything. They would sell pieces of property and possessions and distribute the proceeds to anyone who needed them. Every day, they met together in the temple and they ate in their homes. They shared food with gladness and simplicity. They praised God and demonstrated God's goodness to everyone. Their way of being in community together, of serving one another, demonstrated God's goodness to everyone. Time and again, we see community described as an interplay between fellowship and service and worship and discipleship. So let me put this on the ground in the context of our modern churches. A lot of times we think, oh, I got to get involved in community. And so we say, I'm going to join a Bible study. I'm going to join a life group or an affinity group. And these are all great and important ways to be involved in the church. But I want to suggest that we also need deep and meaningful connections in community through serving in ministries joining teams or even committees, and being a part of the service element of our life together as a church. I know what you're thinking. Ashley, did you just say that I'm going to experience deep fellowship through serving on a committee? (laughs) Yes, I did. And I think it's true. Because when you come together with people and you commit yourselves to serving one another, to serving your church, to serving your community, you are developing a bond that I think is deep and rich and intimate. Our churches, they don't have to just be communities of people who have things in common. In fact, we are seriously impoverished if we are just a group of people who are all the same. But when we come together with people who have different needs, people from different generations and different socioeconomic classes and different racial identities, then we can be a community of foot washers, responding to the needs of others, a community of people who love one another through serving one another. Jesus is instructing his disciples, that is us, to embody and live out his self-sacrificial love in our ongoing life in community together and in our ways of living out God's love in this world. And let me remind you of this. I already said this earlier. This is one of those stories that we know. We become accustomed to hearing, yeah, Jesus washed the disciples' feet. 
But this way of being in community that's centered around mutual love and hospitality and a compassionate desire to serve one another, it's radical. It's not the way that we normally would think of being in community. This way of Jesus, this way of God's love, it is gracious and compassionate, vulnerable and humble. And it's different often than the way of the world around us. It is the love that Jesus shows for each person in this world, for you and for me. And it is the love that we are called to show one another. So friends, let me ask you this. As you search for and long for community, are you also seeking out places to serve and love your neighbor? And not just your neighbor, but your brothers and sisters and friends in Christ? And are you open to the humble love of your siblings in Christ that would allow you to be served as well? Perhaps allowing ourselves to receive the humble service of others, allowing our own feet to be washed, that might be the part that is more difficult than being the ones who serve. As we zoom out and take a look around the table, we see Peter kind of always comes to the front of some of these stories, and this is his response to Jesus. Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Followed by, you will never wash my feet. It is difficult being a community of foot washers because it means that sometimes we are washing feet and sometimes we're allowing our own feet to be washed. We are making ourselves vulnerable enough that we might receive the service of others. And I'm with Peter here. I don't really know that I want anyone, much less Jesus or a spiritual elder, washing my feet. It's too weird, too intimate, too vulnerable. And I mean that literally because even though I have shoes and socks and walk on carpets, my feet sometimes still do smell, so I don't know if I want anyone washing them. But I also mean it metaphorically or figuratively. It is difficult to cry out to God when I am struggling. And sometimes it's even harder to be honest with fellow Christians when I'm struggling or when I have a need. Stanley Hauerwas, he preached a Monday Thursday sermon about this scene from John's Gospel, and he focuses specifically on the vulnerability that's required to allow, to, have, to allow your feet to be washed. This is what he says. In the washing of feet, there is a tenderness and intimacy we cannot help but fear. Threatening, as it does, to expose our presumption that if you really knew me, you could not love me. If you really knew me, you might not think I belong here. Jesus is washing the feet of his disciples like the crucifixion itself is an act of tenderness. It is an act in which all attempts to protect ourselves from tenderness are defeated. Or it is through such tenderness that we are saved. Through such tenderness, we learn to accept our own quite particular forms of poverty and weakness. And in the process, we learn our vulnerability is our strength, enabling us to cry out, I cannot do this on my own. I need your help. I cannot do this on my own. We cannot do this on our own. It is precisely why we find ourselves longing for connection and community after a couple years of feeling like we've just been doing it on our own. We long for tenderness, for someone to look at our struggle and our burdens and remind us you are not alone. We are a community. And when met with the loving and tender gaze of the God who stoops low to wash our feet, we cannot help but be vulnerable and say, sometimes through tears, you're right, Lord. I cannot do this on my own. And we are seen. And in another radical reversal, our vulnerability becomes a sign of strength, not weakness. 
being able to share our struggles and our sufferings and our need, allowing another to truly see us. It is the type of vulnerability that Christ invites us to. Sometimes we need someone to wash our feet. The community we see at this dinner table, it's a complex community. It's imperfect. Around this table, you've got Peter. He'll deny Jesus three times within 48 hours. And Jesus stoops down at Peter's feet, knowing that he would soon deny him. And he sees him. And he loves him. And he shows him tenderness. And he washes his feet. You've got Judas. He will soon betray Jesus and walk away from this community. And Jesus stoops low at Judas's feet. And he sees him. And he loves him. And he shows him tenderness. And he washes his feet. And you've got a whole slew of other people with burdens and baggage and struggles and difficulty. And Jesus sees each one of them and loves them, shows them tenderness, and washes their feet. For all that I've said about what community looks like in this passage, I want, you to, make, I want to make sure you know that Christian community will always be imperfect, just like the imperfections of those sitting at this table. And it's tempting to wait for and long for our idea of perfect community. Then I'll be vulnerable. Then I will serve. Then I will show up. But transformation and intimacy all take place in the context of an imperfect community of Christ followers, just like you and me. My prayer, my hope for each one of you and for Bothell United Methodist Church and for the many churches I know and love and pray for is that we might grow in our tender connection with one another following the example set by Jesus. That we might be strengthened as a community through the ways that we come together in fellowship and in service, through the ways that we dare to be vulnerable, to share our needs with one another, to share the needs of our people, whoever your people might be, with other people who might be able to come alongside, through the ways that we cry out to God and to one another, I cannot do this on my own. I need your help. For Christ has set us an example that we should do as he has done for us. And by God's grace, may it be so. Amen.